Uh, this is Politics on Sunday. I'm Ayodili Uzubakun, standing in for Femi Akonde. In the past 10 days have been challenging time for Nigeria, and that is due to the nationwide protests that hit some major cities of the country. The protests was driven by multiple factors, which include the high cost of living, fuel price increase, among others. The protesters who rallied under the hashtag and bad governance were demanding not just economic relief, but also transparency and good governance. Now, the question on the lips of many Nigerians is that, has the protest achieved its aims after it rounded off on the 10th of August? Also, during the week, the chiefs of defense staff in West Africa called for the return of Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso to the regional bloc. Joining me in the studio for further discussion on the outcome of the protests and the call for the return of Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso to ECOWAS are former ADC presidential candidate Dumebi Kachuku, who is live in the studio with us, and Professor of Political Science Baba Femi Badejo, who joins us live on Zoom from Lagos. Now, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Prof. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, very pleased to join you. All right. Mr. Dubebika thank you. Thanks for having me here today. In spite of the short notice, thank you for honoring us. Thank you. Uh, invites. All right. Now. What do you make of the 10 days? They said it, that they were going to ground the country for 10 days. Yes, the first three days, witness, they came out to protest, but later, some part of the country degenerate, degenerated to a kind of you know, frenzy that a lot of people have been condemning the activities of looters and um, people that turned the genuine protest into another thing. I like the word you use, uh, genuine protest. Um, uh, obviously, we all know what the issues are and we know what, like you earlier um, said, what led to the protest. Um, unfortunately, um, there's a thin line between a protest and a mob. There's a thin line between a mob and anarchy. And there's a thin line between anarchy and civil war. And knowing our fragile state in Nigeria, this is, I guess, this is what a lot of people were afraid of. The people didn't want this to degenerate into a situation where our law enforcement would not have the means to um, put a stop to this or to quell this, um, this riot. Um, um, to, to some extent, you will say the protest was successful. I, said, I will say successful because it drew attention of the world to the plight of Nigerians, many who said the harsh economic realities made living unbearable for them. But unfortunately, I always say this, when you, um, when you get into a car, a bus going from Abuja to Lagos, 14-seater bus, 14 people in that bus. Everybody's going to Lagos, but they all have different intentions mm. for going to Lagos. And so that's what happened with this protest. Mm. There were people who came there to protest their hardship. But of course, you always have people who have political motives and insidious motives. People want to um, set Nigeria back um, three decades, four decades ago, you know. And we saw that mix. And eventually, I don't want us to forget this, over 20 lives were lost. Over 20 lives were lost. I always say this. When lives are lost in protests positive. like this, you're talking about lives of um, Nigerians. Um, most of them are people who you will never hear about. You never know their families. Their families are left to grief. Grief on their own right now. Silence. And we've forgotten those people. And you ask yourself, to what purpose? Um, was it what the pride? Did we really achieve anything? Yesterday, I called for Nigerians at all spheres, at all uh, Nigerians everywhere, that enough of brick batting. We need to start speaking solutions to our problems as Nigerians. Um, we emphasize so much on problems. It's now time to speak solutions because our problems, our protests, will not bring about the solutions to our current hardship right now. So we need to come to a round table of solutions and everyone bring your best solution to the table. Let's ensure that governments. Our megaphone is so loud that government must hear us. And if we're making sense, they must adopt, they must implement the solutions that we're really now to them. Prof, they grounded the country for 10 days. In Abuja, civil servants, workers, shops, commercial outlets did not open for 10 days. Hello, Prof. 
Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes. My I... my understanding with the Demela is that that will be taken by my uh, colleague. I just want to get your reaction. I do not want to react on this issue. I made it very clear. Okay, okay, okay. Um, Mr. Kachiko, what we are saying now is that looking at the way the thing panned out, at the end of the day, we did, the federal government did not have any choice than, you know, you know, to say, oh, we are ready to negotiate. But at the end of the day, they were looking for the face, the people that actually the arrowhead of the protest. The closest we got was the Jade Yanju, who claimed to be the lawyer to, you know, um, the you know, take it back um, group. Omar um, Elisha Oreya was, you know, far back in Manhattan, and um, a lot of people were saying that, look, they put what went, what, um, what turned out in the north at the end of the day, degenerated to more than what the take it back movement envisaged. That it's more than that. That's why I said there's a thin line between the protest and the mob action, and a thin line between mob action and anarchy. And the reality is that um, some people called for a protest. People jumped on that call for a protest. A date was set. And then well, there was no true structure to this protest. You have to understand that there was no true structure to this protest. And we saw Nigerians come out because they were suffering to protest. But a lot of people were smart. When they realized that the protest had been hijacked, people, people are smart enough not to want Nigeria to go back to the dark ages of military rule and what have you. People saw people waving foreign flags and people just said, you know what, I'm not going to be part of this. And especially when we realized that in trying to manage the protests, people lost their lives needlessly. So here we are today, after this protest, what next? Government was seen to be making promises before the protest, during the protest. I, I want to encourage government that whatever they were saying before the protest, government should not make the mistake of thinking that the protests were not successful and we should continue with business as usual. Government must ensure that whatever they need to do to bring down the current level of hardship, they must... I was going to that because, you know, we can't seem to dwell... We seem to be dwelling on the fact that, oh, the protest degenerated and shifting us from the exact focus of the protest that, yeah. look, things are getting out of hand. Correct, yes. Inflation, 34%. Correct. Unemployment. I believe, I believe, it's actual, I believe inflation is actually more than 34%. So mm -hmm. what, what do we need to do about that? That's why we need to speak about solutions. What do we do need to do about inflation? What do we need to do about creating jobs? What do we need to do about tackling insecurity? What do we need to do about our multifaceted problems as Nigerians? It's not the job of government alone. I believe one of the areas that someone like me will fought President um, Tinubu is the fact that he's not been able to manage our diversities. He's not been after the elections to essentially say to Nigerians, you know what, whereas we had a very divisive election, whereas most of us don't agree on the outcome of the election, but today I'm president of Nigeria. I am your president, I lead you, and I want to lead you into a new era of prosperity. But I cannot do it without you. We must come together. You know, um, the opposition or those who are seen to be ahead of opposition, the president, I think, time has come for the president to, for, uh, for rapprochement, for the president to directly, to, to intelligently start reaching out to these people. The president must have emotional intelligence to understand that, you know what, whereas his president, but he's president of Nigerians, and a lot of Nigerians are aggrieved. He must start working towards bringing his people together. Some people, Prof, so, you know, people in Mali and some other African countries, they were, you know, rebelling against bad governors. They rebelled and the military took over. And as at that time, it was, it almost degenerated into a kind of confrontation between ECOWAS and um, those countries. Now, ECOWAS is now saying that they are going to do everything to bring back, after suspending these countries, they want to do everything to bring back these countries. Is this not, you know, a, a kind of a flip flop in policy? Well, we need to probably start by uh, looking at the issue of uh, protests um, because it is not everywhere that pro pro protests have brought uh, coups. 
Uh, a very good example would be Senegal. Uh, Senegal was reasonably involved in a lot of protests in which people lost their lives as President Macky Sall was wanting to stay on in power initially. Then he said that he would uh, uh, step aside but was going to make sure that Sonko did not and his past party did not participate and people died for, 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 for that. A protest is uh, uh, either you're having an individual or most of the time collective actions to try to look at different aspects of society, whether it is uh, political, economic, social, cultural. <clears throat> Protests did not start and it will not end with our own uh, um, uh, uh, our own end bad governance. Um, protests have been going on for quite a while in Togo in trying to uh, uh, ensure that there is an acceptable constitution. Uh, protests in Ghana on economic issues uh, that have been problems. Now, of course, you had a situation, most of the time we think about protests as in the opposite direction and some definition of it trying to, to look at it that way. But if you look at Niger, Niger had a coup in which it called on the people to oppose their relationship with France and people bought onto that and they were demonstrating in support of the government in power. That has also happened in this country as a, as a kid. Uh, well, I wasn't a kid, I was in the university. In fact, the year I was leaving the university when Muritala was shot, February, we were on the street before anybody could say anything in support of the uh, uh, government uh, that uh, the, the remnants, Muritala had been killed, in support of, uh, of General Basunjo at the time. Nobody asked us. So you do have protests that are for government, and in our own situation, you also have governments hiring people to go and attack others uh, during protests. Uh, answers on my, on my mind with respect to this in terms of some of what took place in Abuja uh, and some of the efforts in Lagos too. Having said that, we could then talk about the ferment that has been going on in Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger and the desire of those countries to want to uh, break their relationship, whether it is opportunistic or not, but the point they are put across was to break their relationship with France and expecting that they were going to get support to that effect from the rest of ECOWAS, but ECOWAS gave them a cold shoulder and uh, decided to threaten that if they do not change everything back without thinking through everything, ECOWAS went ahead and issued threats that within seven days um, they were going to uh, uh, storm Niger, which led to the cohesion of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, and uh, invariably denouncing uh, and uh, uh, ill-treating the flags of France and raising the flags of uh, Russia. Um, and of course, those two flags look very much alike. You need to be interested to know that the French flag is horizontal with the white on top and the uh, Russian flag is vertical with the white uh, uh, in the outer portion. But once you don't know that, you get a bit uh, uh, com com confused. Now, uh, as to the question you raised, definitely. They, you suspended the people and they decided that, okay, fine, they are not even going to be members anymore. And ECOWAS cannot be excited about having uh, 16 originally when Gawan uh, and, uh, and Co. signed off on it. Mauritania left. And now if you have a huge portion of three 
living. And what that also means with respect to our uh, current security problems, what it means in terms of the problem of the gas, uh, gas pipeline that we want to send from um, uh, the Delta region through to Europe, via Niger, via Algeria, branching into connecting with Morocco, or we want to go through the longer route of the sea coast, uh, thinking that that is uh, free from uh, insecurity, which is not true, because Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 uh, from Russia into Europe showed us that sabotage under the sea is equally very easy. But in any case, it is a, a flip-flop in terms of uh, policy, as you have said. Um, uh, but then it is good that it is taking place. It is my hope that they will be able to meet uh, the um, uh, alliance of Sahel states if right, it's sir. not too late okay, for them to return to the fold of ECOWAS. Okay, and uh, do maybe I want to take the in, the dangerous time mentioned. You, you saw the flags, and a lot of people are asking. They've been asking questions that how will young Nigerians be openly calling for the military to take over? Well, again, it's a symptom of ignorance, and um, um, like I said, um, people had different reasons for that protest, and there are people who were trying to incite incite a, a wider. Um, um, protest that will lead to um, breakdown of law and order and probably um, change of regime. And that's what they, they, they were introducing that. And I, I think our Nigerians are too advanced now to, um, to fall for such tricks. And obviously, it, it didn't work. Um, a lot of people Some actually... Some um, Kaduna, um, Jigawa, they cleared coffee because of the number of youths that took to the streets. But again, you have a large number of... Um, uneducated youths there, you have a large, the, 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 that's the large, where you have the largest number of poor people in Nigeria, in that, part, um, in that part of Nigeria. So it's expected that where you have people who are not catered for, people who are not feeding properly, people who are poor, it's expected that those are the people who will come out to the streets because obviously they have nothing, nothing else to do. So, um, I mean, one is not surprised that that was happening. All right. In this next piece, let's tell you that over the years, Nigerians have been clamoring for a new constitution. But the latest development now is that the Patriots group is appealing to President Bola Tinobu to convey a national constituent assembly. Let's share President Tinobu's position on this matter. The school that will advocate for the unity of this country. And I believe in it. I definitely want to assure you that whatever is necessary, I will put happiness and good governance in the heart of all Nigerians. This is The President and the former Secretary General of um, the Commonwealth, Chief Emeka Ayaoku, and um, Patriots, they are calling for a constituent assembly that's like a kind of holistic, you know, you know, revamping of the 1999 Constitution instead of the bits and pieces which is ongoing in the National Assembly, has been a kind of with the Ninth Assembly, the Tenth Assembly, it has kicked off again, yeah. that they should just touch it, touch it. But the patriots, they're clamoring that, look, let's change the face of this document. Well, I think that um, it's a very, very sensitive topic. Um, and because of our fragile state as a country, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a tough sell. Hmm. I believe that, again, I want to use the analogy of going to Lagos. Um, you can go to Lagos by air. You can go to Lagos by road. Um, I will go to Lagos by road. I'm sorry, I will go to Lagos by air. Yeah. Going to, in this case, going to Lagos by air, amending the constitution, the fastest way to amend the constitution is through the current um, um, NAS National, National Assembly. Because we have a very inequitable constitution, 
when you say inequitable, it means that it's, it's, it's not favorably balanced. It's tilted in favor of some people. Do you think that those people will buy into any idea that seeks to upturn what they are benefiting? No. But I believe that slowly but surely, we can keep on chipping away at this through the National Assembly. And one day we will have a group of Nigerians who believe in justice, in fairness, in equity, who understand that the only way we can have true and lasting peace in Nigeria is by having an equitable constitution. And those people will do what is right by all Nigerians. So we'll have a Nigeria that works for everybody. But going through this route is going to be a very, very difficult sell. It's up to the president to try it, but from what I see, from what the body language of some sections of Nigeria, because, I believe... Because don't forget the National Assembly is there, that its responsibility is to tinker that, with the constitution that's, and that, everything. That's why so I said... To go and sit down in another constituent assembly... That's why I said yes. that the fastest way to Lagos is by air. The hmm. fastest way to amend the constitution is through the National Assembly. We must bring pressure to bear on the National Assembly... To work harder can to the work National faster. Assembly decide to embark on a kind of full-scale, holistic change uh, uh, in which they protest that's, that's, they are soliciting for? That's, that's why they are there. They can do whatever. You see, once they understand that they are working for Nigerians, once they understand what Nigerians want, they must do that. But you have to understand the, the kind of dynamics that is at play there. The Senate President or the, or the Speaker of the House, they are there at the behest of their colleagues. Again, it's what their colleagues want. What do a proponents of the people who are in that house, what do they actually want from um, the leadership of the house? And again, if they are sensitive to the yearnings and aspirations of most Nigerians, then they will do what Nigerians want. Most Nigerians want a better constitution. That's the honest to God truth. When we embark on the change of our national anthem, right, or the change of, the, uh, of our pledge, you know, I felt that it was talking this in nature that what, the, what we sh ought to be speaking to is a change in the constitution. And they are driving at that. More and more people are driving towards that. And I believe it will happen. But we must. We must. I believe First that. Do you believe that the 1999 constitution is defective? It's grossly flawed. It's grossly flawed. We all know that. Everybody knows that, right? But you know what? I, what I want the patriots to do is the next step they should do is that they must visit the National Assembly. They must use their influence and they must ask these people work harder, work faster towards amending this constitution. Nigerians are tired of waiting. We need an equitable constitution that works for all Nigerians. So, the Petra should visit the National Assembly I, 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 I suggest, and channel I, their demands. I suggest that they, they, the that, that they do that. Assembly. And yeah. finally, now, in what appears to be a major shift from previous claims by the Dangote Refinery, the group chief strategy officer, Liu Suleiman, says 60% of the crude supply so the refinery was done by the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited. The submission now supersedes that of the chief, the group chief commercial officer who claimed that the NPC has not been supplying sufficient crude for its production. What does this mean for NPC and Dangote Group? We're following it, this back and forth between NPC. Well, um, it's a very, very interesting question. Um, I mean, it's, I sympathize with Dangote. Um, Dangote, for the first time, probably in his business life, he's faced with a situation where he does not have everything working for him. Um, whereas in the business he's world... He's always been having that patronage. Yes. 100% yes, 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 government yes, support, yes, everything. Yes. In the business so. world, people perceive him to be a bully in chief, Right. And um, so in the domestic markets, he's bullied his way through having a lot of things work his way, right? And for the first time, he's playing in an arena that is international in nature. And so this means that whereas we have NNPC in the mix, but it's international trade that is governed by international dynamics, international laws, commercial um, uh, treaties and what have you. So Dan Gote cannot actually get what he wants. My biggest problem with what I've been watching is that because he's been able to bully his way through a lot of his other transactions, he now appears to be trying to bully the GCU of NNPC to do what he wants and also bully NUPRC and, uh, and all the other regulatory agencies to, to do what he wants. But the issue is that 
um, oil and gas is governed by treaties, and there are international best practice best practice treaties that everyone must obey. I'm seeing the somersault in statements that are being issued um, uh, by the Dangote organization, which means that all their adults are not in a row right now. But also, I want to advise Nigerians and uh, the media especially, there's a danger in what we call a single narrative. And the narrative that has been emanating, especially in the media and in most places, that is that Dangote is being unfairly treated. Persecuted. He's being persecuted. I will say this to you. Dangote has petrochemicals that is working right now. Um, if you understand what's going on, most of what he's producing is already being exported. In the domestic market, it's not made any dent or any penetration. We see more of Indo Indorama doing that. Dangote, as a business, as a smart businessman, is looking for dollars, and he will go where the dollars are. So, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when Nigerians feel that um, it's patriotic to support Dangote, a businessman, um, over their national interest, they are not really understanding. And let me, I, I want to just, just drop one more thing. We don't have that much oil for domestic consumption, considering the contractual obligations we have as Nigerians. That means the last administration had a, a lot of forward sales that they had done in order to borrow money. So the little oil that we have now is being fought for by Dangote, by Wari Refinery, by Potakot Refinery, by the likes of Water Smith and all the other modular refineries. Mm. Now, mm. if you are NNPC... Our time is fast, so it's, uh, okay. <laughs> we lot more for the $19 billion investment by Dangote. He granted an interview with CNN yesterday and he said that, f f looking back, that is a big regret. You know, embarking on that project, that it's so painful. What is, you know, turning up now? But we can't exhaust it today. I want to <laughs> invite you for another Sunday so that we can just talk about this extensively. I want to thank you, Dumabi Kachuku, the ADC former presidential candidate. And I also want to thank Professor Babafemi Badejo from the Political Science Department of the University of Lagos. I think Lagos State University there. I want to thank you for being my guest. And that's our offering today. Join us next week for another episode of the program. You can watch the repeat broadcast tonight at 11 p.m. I'm Ayodili Uzubakum. See you next week and God bless Nigeria.